Welcome to this episode of On Finding Peace, brought to you by Life's Journey Life Coaching. Our host, Chris Shea, is a counselor, nationally recognized speaker, and author on topics of guiding us to finding peace in our daily lives. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. Well, welcome everyone to another episode of On Finding Peace. I'm your host, Chris Shea, and this is the podcast where we talk about practical tips that we all can do on a daily basis, which can lead us to finding our inner peace. I know that inner peace is possible. I've been without it. I've found ways to get it. And on this podcast, we talk about ways that we can find it and keep it on a daily basis. Another episode of On Finding Peace. And today's guest is Craig Perra. He is the founder of the Connection Coaches and the creator of the Mindful Habit. And we're going to be talking about the habit cycle and what he does and all of his work around trying to break Uh, the habits that we have. And as we look on this podcast for finding our inner peace, part of that is examining our habits and the habits which are conducive to our inner peace and those which are not. So uh, we're really appreciative to have Craig with us and uh, let's hear some wisdom from him. Sure. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here, you know, and I love the, um, the direction because the focus is, is, is peace, you know, how nice to have that, that inner peace and, and what I've learned through a lifetime of the opposite of inner peace, constant turmoil, turmoil and struggle manifesting it by way of sex addiction, porn addiction, drug addiction, um, alcohol addiction, addiction to self-loathing, um, addicted to bad food, addicted to a shitty life. I, I came to, th- through those failures, because I, I hit rock bottom, Chris, seven years ago, um, I got fired from um, uh, an executive job at a billion-dollar insurance company. Um, they didn't catch me doing anything, but my performance had slipped to such a radical degree, they knew something was up, and they asked me to leave um, that day. And, um, it, yeah, so I lost my job. I went into impatient. Um, you know, I tried to kill myself. That's what put me an impatient, consumed with compulsive sexual behavior, um, abusing bath salts. And, and here I am with a beautiful wife, two beautiful children. Um, but I hated myself. I hated my life. And it was at that low point where I discovered the power of habits. And, and that really came from my rejection of the traditional, because every counselor I saw said, you got to get, you know, go to meetings. And I was like, goodness gracious, that hasn't worked yet. <laughs> that hasn't worked yet for me. Um, there's got to be something else. And, and therapists talking more about my family of origin and the root cause and, and, and where it came from and mom and dad and, and all that stuff. And I just, I just was so you know, frustrated. I knew in my heart that I couldn't do the same thing that hadn't worked before. I just, just, I just knew it. And um, just, you know, Facebook, Twitter, or, you know, who knows, I just started, um, saw something about habits. In fact, it was an article that challenged the disease-based model of addiction. And, and here I am, I've been an addict, quote unquote, for 20 years, and I did not even know such a universe existed. <laughs> didn't know that there were people saying the disease-based model is woefully inadequate to treat compulsive behavior. Didn't know that in the case of sex and porn addiction, the American Psychiatric Association rejected the disease-based model. The American Society for Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists calls using it for the treatment of unhealthy sexuality negligent. They say it falls beneath the standard of care. Now, 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 obviously that model has saved millions of lives. So, so it's not all bad. And for some people it works very well, but I needed alternatives. And those alternatives came to me um, in, in the form of habits. And I learned that habits literally controlled our lives 
And anger is a habit. My self-deprecation was a habit. My acting out sexually was a habit. My acting out with porn was a habit. My getting defensive when my wife was around was a habit. And, and, and I saw my just life consumed by these negative habits. And I said, I need to learn more about these. And that's, that, that, that's, that's really where um, the journey started for me because I, I had to save my life. Uh, and I really like how you make that distinction because I've spent over 20 years working in the, in the field of addictions, primarily substance abuse. And the disease model is great for that. But I totally agree with you that there is a difference when you're dealing with a substance-based addiction versus one of the other, what's now called the, the para-addictions. Uh, so I'm really glad that you make that distinction because I think a lot of people get stuck and aren't finding the right help, uh, you know, in, in the way that they can break uh, their habits and, and their compulsions. You know, and, and that's the important thing, because one of the things I've learned, you know, when I when I onboard guys, you know, guys that I work with one on one, Chris, one of the things I've learned, and I'm so blessed to be in a place where I'm able to, you know, not work with everybody. I, I, I just as want to I just as want as well want to direct someone someplace else than take them on because that that connection is so important, right? And there are some people who are going to connect to the disease-based model. There are some people who aren't. So it's so important for you people listening. If what you're doing isn't working, then, then try something else. Because in along with when I started studying habits, I started to learn about the other side of that coin, which which is mindfulness. And that that's a talk about that. Um, you know, maybe another time, but that had a you know a massive massive influence on 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 habits. So, but when I when I first started to understand habits. You know, I remember reading a book and, and the book, I forget the title at the time, but I was also reading Charles Duhigg's book, The Power of Habit. Phenomenal book for those of you who haven't read it. But I remember reading something like, you know, scientifically we know that your triggers are biologically hardwired. And, and I kind of stopped and I uh, looked at it again and I read it again, and I said, well, goodness gracious. So that time when I was leaving the therapist's office and I got triggered doesn't mean that I'm a piece of garbage. Mm -hmm. It's just natural to, uh, occurrence to my external stimuli. Well, well, as a systems thinker, I've always been a systems thinker in, in, in my career, and I had to bring some of that skill set to my personal life. I said, well, if that's true, then I need to learn to use those triggers. If they're not going away, how do, I create, how do they become an asset? How do they become an ally? How can I, how can I use them to create um, a powerful awakening? How can I use them to keep my executive functioning in control versus having my executive functioning take the back seat to one of my lower selves when I, you know, be, when we get possessed by, by habits, right? That's what happens. And so, you know, for you people who are listening, just think about, you know, maybe when you get angry or maybe when you get defensive or maybe you get jealous or maybe you get triggered to eat some food or triggered to watch pornography or triggered to use a drug. And, and there's an energy shift in the body that happens. That, that, that's what I call a trigger. And I'm going to walk through um, the habit cycle now um, so for your listeners can, can start to play with it. But, but notice when you, when you get defensive, you get angry, you get triggered, there's an energy shift in the body. And, 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 and if you can cultivate an awareness around that energy shift and the following thoughts – that accompany that energy shift, well, now you can use that awareness to, to snap out of it. Use a cognitive behavioral thought replacement technique like wrong thought right, I'm um, snapping the elastic band on your wrist, a form of aversion therapy, shaking your head, taking a breath, screaming, doing something. You now can interrupt that habit cycle instead of being a slave to it. So- right. So that's, that, that, that's the meat of it. That's the meat of it. The triggers, then come these thoughts that frame that reality, and then we do something. Then we take action, which is the third phase. Where do you think these habits are formed? You know, I, I know on the substance end, we talk a lot about the chemical 
uh, imbalances or how the substance itself is changing the chemical nature of the brain. When you look at habits, such as what you're saying, you know, sex addiction or gambling addiction or whatever it may be, wh where do you think this is originating? Yeah, in, in childhood, it's very easy for me to go to that place. And, you know, one of the, um, a, a quote that I remember reading too was, I, your, your major psychological belief systems are hardwired by the time you're 12 years old. And, 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 I, and I've read up on that. Some people put it higher, some people put it lower, um, depending upon what they mean by, by major psychological belief systems. But so much of our attachment patterns um, our behavioral responses, um, what our relationship with the truth is, with lying, with, with, with self-soothing, with anger, um, with our self-esteem is, is baked, you know, at or around that time. Forget about the precise year, but at or around that time. That, that, that's how these systems begin to, to forge in a, in, a, in, a, in a way where it becomes the manner in which we um, experience reality. So, so those habits around numbing, coping, and escaping, for example, let's say, um, you know, client X is, is, you know, learns to masturbate every time dad yells at him, every time he gets frustrated, every time, and, and, and nothing inherently wrong with masturbation, and, but, but now it's become a crutch. And, and then this young man develops, he gets older, um, and, and that, that, that sexual behavior becomes that primary coping strategy. And, and then, you know, wh where it goes is, is, is obviously independent upon the individual. But I think that these habits come from two places, biology. I think there are certain innate things about us as humans around our response to fear um, that, that are baked into who we are and, 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 and environmental. And, um, and, and, and that's why it's so important to understand this cycle because the reality is in terms of, you know, attachment patterns, habits around anger, you know, being defensive, being less than that self-deprecation, this stuff's 20, 30, 40 years old, depending upon the client. You know, I'm 46 and I still trip on the sidewalk and call myself a piece of shit. Oh, it, so, it, and that's so, a, a strong thing that self-deprecation really gets in the way. Uh, it, it, and it's always the root cause. So in my clients who struggled, mo most of my clients struggle with sex and porn addiction. I work with a few um, drug addicts, a uh, number of guys who's, uh, and gals who've struggled with food, but, but kind of a, a, enough of a, uh, uh, you know, different swath of the population. And, and it's about finding the right person who's going to work with, with, with the right system. And, and those patterns for all of them, every single person, um, the, the behavior wasn't the primary problem. Like I've never worked with a client whose primary problem was drugs. I never worked with a client whose primary problem was prostitutes. I never worked with a client whose primary problem was eating, even though they defined their, their problem as a sex addict, drug addict, food addict, that behavior was the symptom and, and the root cause, the common denominator that has existed in every client that I've ever worked with. And I'm waiting for that, you know, to change. I'm, I'm, I'm open to, you know, the human condition, you know, endless possibilities. But that, that hole um, that, that, that they were trying to fill was a profound and deep lack of love for self. And, and, yeah, yeah. And, and, and here they are filling it. You know, it's the cup that can never be filled. It. It's just no matter what they do. Um, that, that cup is not going to be filled. And, and seeing the role that habits played in, in filling that cup and, 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 and also realizing you know, so much of my sex addiction using the sex addiction model is focused on the behavior. Well, I also learned to break a habit. You have to make a habit. So that means my success is focusing on other behaviors. And, and, and once I started to understand how the past, how the biology and the environment, how the past, how my programming um, from my child childhood, which I had some, uh, you know, host of challenges as so many of us do, um, was that 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 trigger, and then that self deprecation, 
you know, that, that's what I needed to focus on because it was the self-deprecation, that lack of love for self that produced all of the negative acting out behavior. And seeing that from a habitual perspective had a radical impact on my life. What, um, you know, for the people who are listening, what do you see as a reason for a lot of statistics that show the uptick in sex and porn addiction? Yeah, accessibility. Uh, Accessibility combined with terrible sex education. Uh, We are schizophrenic in this country when it comes to sexuality. You've got extreme... Uh, you know, porn is available on every device and every browser and every app. And, and you know, kids can get it with the click of a button. And, and yet, yet we're not teaching evidence-based sex education in most schools. Um, we're not teaching people to honor and, and respect that part of ourselves as men. And, you know, my hope, my hope and in, 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 to, 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 that, you know, that, that it's like it has – from this, from this crisis that we're in, where men are addicted to pornography, flushing their lives away, um, you know, down the toilet, medicating and numbing with this product. You've got high rates of erectile dysfunction, you know, young men unable to perform because they're, they've learned to, um, they've learned their sexuality through porn. And until we start having frank discussions with our, with our boys and, and with our girls around sexuality and what it is and what an important role it plays in your life. And, 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 and it's not just for um, procreation, it's for pleasure, because that's certainly how they're going to get introduced to it. So we can pretend that, that, that that's not true, um, but it is, but it is. And, oh, and, and most definitely. And, and I had figured that, the availability is probably the biggest issue. And, uh, you know, I think that's changed things greatly because people don't need to leave their homes or they can be wherever they are and still access it where, you know, when I was growing up, you had very limited access. Very right. Yeah. I I'm a bit older than you are. So it's, you know, I, I can see that, that if you needed, needed that wanted that you went through great lengths to be able to get it well i'm 46 and i remember the old days uh, which if you wanted pornography you had to drive to the shittiest neighborhood in town and and walk into a bookstore that looks sketchy as all heck oftentimes guys walking around looking for the 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 fun fun in the back room watching the video boots and before then they had the movies um, like it, 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 it was, it required effort. It required effort. These young bucks these days, you just open up the internet within three clicks. You're watching the most graphic pornography that the human mind could even contemplate. And I think that last point of yours is part of the issue as well, because unless I wasn't in the sketchiest areas, the sketchy areas that I knew where you could get it, didn't have some of the graphic stuff that you can get online nowadays. Oh yeah. Oh my God. And, and, you know, we're, we're, we're curious, right? Think of the, our young minds, you know, I remember my young mind exploring pornography. Well, I've what, what else is there? What else is there? What else is there? And, and, and now my sexuality is wiring. Now it's wiring around this, this, this medium that's becoming my reality. And, 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 that coexisting with a long-term monogamous relationship, I, I think for most people, and for me, was incredibly difficult. Um, and, you know, none of my porn use made me a better lover, made me connect with my wife, made me uh, more engaged and, and improve the quality of my life. It, 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 you know, my sexuality was broken. Um, it was a dirty and disgusting part of myself that needed to heal in a powerful way and you know eliminating porn from the equation has been nothing but 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 you know better sex and a happier life um but but that's a tough battle to fight now man pornography just opened up a store in new york city a ground level four porn hub there's a store so the mainstreaming is is happening and um that's why the only solution is um sex education and I do see that as down the road going to 
most definitely be mainstream, you know, with so many people, uh, you know, who have this access and as they get older, they're, they're going to put it more as the mainstream than what it used to be, you know, back in my day, as they say. Um, for people who are listening, who, whether it's sex addiction, porn addiction, gambling, wh- whatever their habit may be, what would you suggest for those who want to get away from that? What are some of the, the very first things that they can do just to get started? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, first thing that they can do is download the app, one of these three following apps, Headspace, uh, Calm, 10% uh, Happier, um, and Insight Timer. I'll say those again for those of you who are taking notes. It's um, Headspace, Calm, Insight Timer, and 10% Happier. Those are four apps that will teach you mindfulness. And, and, and mindfulness is the opposite. You know, automatically responding to external stimuli. That's how I define a habit. Mindfulness is the exact opposite of that. Not automatically um, instantaneously responding to external stimuli through a diligent, focused attention on the breath. So, so mindfulness is critically important. Mindfulness is changing the way um, you know we're treating our our our, our challenged in in uh, in the world and and in our elites, our you know professional athletes. They're all going to mindfulness clinics. The CEOs are learning mindfulness so so they can be better, elevate their performance. So sitting and breathing is one of the most effective things that someone can do. And these apps will guide you there step by step along the way. That that's one suggestion. The um, second suggestion is to pick a habit, pick it, whether it's your compulsive behavior, maybe if there's too much energy around that right now, it's it's your anger, or it's your self-deprecation, or it's your getting defensive, and plug that into the habit cycle. So track for a period of seven days your triggers, and that means writing them down. What was the trigger? What were those exact thoughts? What action did you take? And then after doing that for a period of time, you know, inserting kind of what I call the speed bump between thought and action. And that's the phrase wrong thought, right? Which is just a simple thought replacement technique from cognitive behavioral therapy. We know it works. They've studied it. Oh, exactly. that thought replacement technique and get it, you know, so first, you know, bringing awareness to the cycle. And then the step two is interrupting that cycle. You know, however you decide to do it, snapping the wristband, taking a breath, you know, yelling, screaming. I find that that wrong thought right really does, does well for most people because uh, it's easy, it's quick, it's just, just automatic. And you'll learn that that's not going to work every time. These habits are powerful. They've been in you. Yeah for such a long period of time, but that's a start. So combining the mindfulness with some habit work, you're able to create uh, significant change quickly. What, what is going to get in the way of someone breaking this habit cycle? What, what do you think is the biggest, you know, if they start doing what you had said, they download the apps, they're working on their triggers and, and they're really, focused, you know, I want this. And I've seen this a lot with substance use. You can want this as much as possible and then it goes wrong. And it wasn't for the lack of desire, but it goes wrong. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I think I, I want to just first add to my list of two things that they can do. The third thing that they can do is eat well, sleep well, exercise, hydrate. And, and, and again, back to that practicing mindfulness. Those five things are so important. So what's going to get in the way is not doing those things, not having the support system in place in order to 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 you know, maintain that vigilance. And, and here's the thing. I think, you know, I recommend people go into it. Um, expecting they're going to fail. And I don't mean that from a negative perspective because failure is opportunity. You're never going to get it right 100% of the time. Do I snap at my kids and, and get angry at my wife and say stupid things? Of course I do, but I do it a lot less. And when it happens, I'm quick to say, whoa, 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 whoa hold on, sorry about that here. So, hold on a second, you know, let me, let me take a breath. Um, and, and so you're going to make mistakes. But if you can, instead of it 
you know, having to be 100%. But if you can start interrupting that habit cycle, and, well, and to answer your question, people, one thing that will thwart people is they will set goals that are too high. Um, their failure will discourage them instead of them seeing that as an opportunity. Because if you just realize you failed, well, goodness gracious, you're paying attention. That's mindful. That's good. That's the point. You're never going to be mindful all the time unless you go to one of these temples somewhere and dedicate the rest of your life to doing it. We've chosen to be out in the world, to talk to people and engage. We need habits. We need habits. So, 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 So even set the bar low. Even set the bar low, I find that to be such an effective technique because what that does is it allows that systemic change to take root. So you've got to set yourself up for success. Um, And and, and so many people set themselves up for failure. So you're never going to be perfect. Set the bar low. Just start bringing some awareness to this part of your life and, and taking care of yourself as best you can, practicing some mindfulness, and, um, you know, the combination of those things are really, really powerful and can, and can drive change. But if I had to say um, to uh, what, what people should do, um, and I love saying this because it sounds so contrary what we are as life coaches or, or me as a life coach is supposed to do, but lower the bar, lower the bar. I've seen so often people either increase their anxiety or relapse into their addictions because of the unreasonable expectations and they just go for all of it. And and I get why you want to, you really want, you know, if I have this new life, I really want to get out there and just do it all, all at once. That could be unreasonable at this time, not down the road, but at this time and being mindful, staying in that moment really makes a lot of sense. And, I also like how you're bringing in the notion that it's okay to fail. So often people forget that. So often it's, if I fail, then I'm a failure myself and I might as well just go out into my addiction even more instead of recognizing that maybe the failure is part of the process if we can learn from it. Absolutely. It, 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 you know, there's, what do we love about success stories? When someone goes on stage, you get paid lots of money to motivate people. They, you know, if they told a story like, you know, I got it right the first time I made $10 million. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice day. No one wants to hear that. We want to hear how they were in the basement and they lost their job and they got fired and the girlfriend left and then the cat died and the cow ran away and, and, and they were low than they've ever been in their entire life. So then this idea hit them and they clawed and they scratched and they had this vision and this passion and no matter, nothing was going to hold them back and they failed again, but they kept going. Um, You know, there's no such thing as success without failure. So, you know, sometimes depending upon the client, you know, if I've got someone with a long, long, long history of super duper compulsive behavior, we start with the harm reduction model instead of the abstinence model, because what that does instantly off the bat, which is, hey, man, you're, you're, you know, what, what? So you've hired me and and I'm going to say some magic words that are going to make you never do the thing again. That's preposterous. It's preposterous. Think that. And, and a lot of people do think that. And a lot of people do think that. So I want to create a culture where uh, they, um, they, they know that failure is something that's, that we're going to get excited about and we're going to talk about it and we're going to analyze it. We're going to understand why you failed and come up with a plan to, to prevent that failure from happening again and come up with a plan to execute upon that failure. So you can, don't have to stay down. You fall down, you get up. Yeah, is that what you're supposed to do? Oh, yeah. Oh my, you know I mean, I'm not supposed to self-deprecate and shame myself for three weeks. Yeah, try it this way. Fall down, get back up. Oh, my God. Wow. What the, wasn't that crazy? And, and so I really want to create a culture where people, um, you know, get excited. If, you know, that might be too strong of a word in talking about their failures because there's so much to learn from them. And if they become this evil thing that's never to happen, Again, well, they're not going to be very successful for very long because failure is everywhere. You can't live without it. And I totally agree. And it's refreshing to hear you say that when I first got into the addiction field 20 some years ago, I was taught the opposite, that 
they need to get the perfection. And if, if they do relapse, you, you know, they are a failure. There wasn't this notion of the progress, not perfection. There wasn't that notion of maybe I'm going to learn from this. I caught that as the years went on where I started understanding how that was unreasonable, but it's, it's really refreshing to hear that you are going about it in, in that same way because we can't hold the bar higher for ourselves than we would ever hold it for anybody else. Absolutely. And, you know, I love, I love, I love saying this because it's so, it, it, it's so much fun. And I like saying th this expression I'm about to say, because um, it, it, it's almost so contrary to what I think the perception is. And I tell people all the time to lower the bar, you know, and, and I learned that concept in yoga. And it's been a fascinating one because by lowering the bar, it empowered me to create long-term systemic change versus these you know, uh, ebbs and flows where, oh, I'm going to, you know, run every day for, for 10 days and, and you know, it didn't last or, or I'm going to do this for, for, for all this period of time. And, but by taking this, um, you know, th this realistic approach and setting attainable goals, you know, goals need to be specific. They need to be measurable. They need to be attainable. They need to be relevant. They need to be time bound. That A, that A is where so many people screw up, you know, and, and, you know, it, it is hard. It is hard to, um, um, to, to, uh, I think accept that reality for some people, but, um, it, it's, you know, you can either, pretend it doesn't exist and, and ignore it and let it bite you. Um, or, or you can embrace that reality. And, um, you know, a slip does not have to be the end of the world. It doesn't have to be the bender. It doesn't have to be the, Oh, you know, uh, I mean, it, 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 okay. Okay. All right. All right. What can I learn from it? And when you start taking that approach and start changing that relationship with failure, um, that's when you're able to create systemic change. So it's, 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 it's so important. I totally agree with you. Yeah. And I, I love that message. And on that note is we're kind of wrapping this up. Is, is there any message that we haven't gotten to say or anything that you really want to make sure that people understand about, you know, this whole uh, habit cycle and how you break it? Sure, 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 sure. The, you know, there, there's a, a well-settled scientific frat fact that has become a commandment in my life. And that is to break a habit, you have to make a habit. We know that to be true. And mice, rats, monkeys, apes, humans, we know to break a habit, we've got to make a habit. And, and, and so much of the addiction community is focused on that break a habit part. And so it's just, if you're out there, listening to remember that your success in not doing the thing is a function of you doing something else. So dedicate that focus, that attention to doing something else. Love yourself as hard as you possibly can. Practice rigorous self-care. Take care of yourself. Eat well, sleep well, hydrate, exercise, meditate take care of yourself. That's how you're going to break free. And that's how you're going to create long-term systemic change. And if anyone is struggling with compulsive sexual behavior, um, I've got a number of really powerful programs on my website, www.themindfulhabit.com. So uh, check that out on themindfulhabit.com. And um, Chris, truly an honor and a privilege to be here. Thank you for letting me talk about my favorite thing in the world, which is habits. It's been an awesome conversation and the passion that you have for this and for the people you work with is very evident in the way that you're speaking about this. Thank I you. I love that you gave us some very practical tips and I will have your website on the show notes so people can click through and I've looked over the website. I, I highly encourage people to click on to the website get the help that you need from the people who are specifically trained to give you that help. So I really encourage people to just take that step. I like the practical tips that you gave and I really appreciate the time that you took to be with us. Oh, truly a privilege, Chris. Thank you so much. Best of luck to you, brother. Uh Thank you for listening to this podcast episode.
And I hope that the message in this episode has inspired you and given you some of the tools that you need to find peace in your life. If you have found those tools and you found this to be inspiring and you know of others who also need these tools, please share this podcast with them. Let them know of the opportunities out there that they too can find their inner peace. Thank you very much for the sharing. Thank you for listening and have a very mindful day. listening to this episode with Chris Shea. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com.